So we're back, talking about Azor's Gateway, which before the break we mentioned is a two-drop legendary artifact that says pay one, tap, draw a card, then exile a card from your hand. If cards with five or more different converted mana costs are exiled with Azor's Gateway, you gain five life, untap Azor's Gateway, and then transform it. It turns into Sanctum of the Sun, a legendary land that says Tap, add X mana of any one color to your mana pool, where X is your life total. That's, uh, that's pretty good. We haven't really seen an effect like that, I don't think, ever. And so it makes sense, almost, that there would be something this powerful at the heart of his content. Paying for it fairly in a normal game of magic, not thinking of commander shenanigans. You're... Dropping it out on turn two, and then you are, have to activate it on turn three, four, five, six, seven. Assuming you can to transform it. it. Right. Now, of course, the biggest concern with this card is if it gets destroyed before you can flip it. However, even if it does, you were still able to loot and kind of filter yeah. cards out of your hand. Yeah. But then you'll untap. And assuming you haven't lost any life, which again is unlikely, but you in a normal game of Magic, you're looking to tap this thing for 20 mana of any one color. Right. Realistically, um, even if you're doing poorly, you're going to tap it for 5 mana of any one color or more. Right. And that should be enough to help you do something. Now, I will say that the first thing I thought of when I saw the Sanctum of the Sun with its artwork is uh, there was one particular Dwarven Ruin in Skyrim, <laughs> The Elder Scrolls V, where you had to kind of assemble a light puzzle in order to open uh, the container for an Elder Scroll. And uh, that is very much what the Sanctum of the Sun reminds me it of. It also shows that the Immortal Sun is a lot bigger than I thought, based upon that the is true. card work, or the card artwork for the Immortal Sun itself, which we'll talk about in just a but, moment. Yeah. It really it's a cool really, card. Really, really cool card. Let's talk about the Immortal Sun itself. So this is it, right? This is the thing, the thing that's at the heart of Exiland that everyone's been after. That Azor uh, kind of set his trap in place to ensure that Planeswalkers couldn't leave with it, uh, including himself. So what does this do mechanically? And then what can we infer about its mechanics that would indicate what it does in the lore? So I'll let you take that first. So it's a six drop artifact, legendary artifact. Players can't activate Planeswalker's loyalty abilities. So as far as the lore that we've seen so far, it's right on point. There. At the beginning of your draw step, draw an additional card. It's empowering you. Spells you cast cost one less to cast. It's giving you power. Creatures you control get plus one plus one. It's empowering you. It does a little of everything. Essentially what this card is trying to go for is two things. A, it's the best version of certain cards we already have had in Commander, those being uh, like kind of like a Caged Sun or um, even things like a, that one Staff that draws you a card at your upkeep. Staff of Nin. Yeah. Uh, Staff of Nin. Um, but also, it's designed to be able to go in any deck, no matter what you're it, playing. And it null rods Planeswalkers. Right. So it goes in any deck that's not, not running Planeswalkers. Because um, again, what card doesn't want to draw additional cards? What deck doesn't want to have their spells cost one less? And of course, only certain decks will care about their creatures getting plus one plus one. But most decks are okay with that, even if they're just playing like Delver's Snapcaster type deals. Mm -hmm. So... This thing, powered by Azor's Planeswalker Spark, designed to prevent Planeswalkers from leaving because he did not want them to know about the Plane of Ixalan. The exact reason for that, I'm not 100% sure on yet, but this plays into the plans of Nicol Bolas, because we know that Nicol Bolas, he engineered the creation and theft of the Planar Bridge from Kaladesh, Yep. We know that he set up a very long con on Amon Ket to get the end goal of which is that he has an immortal army of empowered zombies. Um, and something I missed reading Kaladesh lore the first time 
the planar bridge that was designed and built and now is incorporated into Tezzeret's arm can only transport from one plane to another non-living matter. Interesting. Which fits in very nicely in a mesh with the fact that Bolas has an army of zombies. Well, and is the immortal sun itself organic? We don't know. Well, it's it's an artifact, and the immortal sun is a power source. Mm. And that is what... And because it's not just a power source, it is a power source built with a planeswalker spark. Yes. Because Azor sacrificed his spark to create the immortal sun. It's why we have Azor the creature, not Azor the planeswalker. Exactly. And we know from the tutor slash wish card that Bolas does get the immortal sun at the end of this story arc. Another piece of a nefarious puzzle. And which you see it being oh. teleported away. Um, which actually fits really on flavor with the card. A lot of these cards are so on flavor because it lets you tutor for a card. It also lets you tutor for a card outside the game, aka teleport the immortal sun from another plane to wherever he is. Mm, yes. So... The Immortal Sun is a power source that Bolas is going to need to fuel his planar portal. Right. So, now Bolas has the ability to move his army from plane to plane, but now the question remains, what will he do with it? Mechanically speaking, it's an expensive card that's designed to give you value over time in the same way that a planeswalker does. Um, it doesn't do anything immediately, but once you've Other attached than the next down turn, right, essentially. Um, but as far as benefiting you, aside from that, um, you get to draw a card at the next turn, and then spells you cast cost one less, and then everything's buffed. So it's designed to really give you value. I mean, I don't know. The Immortal Sun does something immediately if you have a Silent Gravestone in your hand. A Silent Gravestone? A Silent Gravestone. It's a one-drop artifact that says cards and graveyards can't oh, be the yeah. targets of spells or abilities. You can pay for, tap, and exile Silent Gravestone, and all cards from all graveyards and draw a card. It's a, a very expensive Relic of Progenitus. Yeah, and you know, honestly, if it didn't cost four, it would be a much better Relic of Progenitus because it has Graph Digger's Cage built half onto it. So it's kind of like a halfway point between Graph Digger's Cage and... With way too much mana cost involved. Right. Um, at, least it'll, at least it still comes but down. But paired more. with the Immortal Sun, you can lock out Planeswalkers and any kind of reanimation effect. Right. Not that there's a whole lot of reanimation going on right now. Just a little bit. Um, so there's a few more rare artifacts to look at. Yeah. The Awakened Amalgam is, is an interesting card. It is a star star for four. Its power and toughness are each equal to the amount of differently named lands you control. So this is interesting because you'll notice a lot of lands in this set, more than usual, are legendary. Mm. Because they flip from enchantments. This Land guy go, Tribal, my favorite format. Essentially, yes. He, he's four colorless, so we already know he can go in any deck, essentially, no matter the color restriction. And as long as you're playing cards of different names, like even if you just have mountain, forest, island, swamp, plains, he's a 5-5. Five five. Then if you then go and throw in legendary lands or uh, lands that's capped for multiple colors, if theoretically, if every land in your deck had a different name, this guy could be a 22-22. Let's talk about how he, how he synergizes with some of these uh, legendary flip enchantments. Yes. He's a creature that you can reanimate with the Golgari one. Mm -hmm. He's an artifact that counts towards the Izzet one. Mm -hmm. And, uh, what else? There was a third one. The Boros one probably he, doesn't care about him too much. Nope, because he doesn't have the keyword. The Simic one can put counters on him. Can put counters on him. So he works decently well with yeah. all of the legendary flip plans. I would say so. You know what works? You know what's a very handy card to have around? What's that? The Captain's Hook. Yes. It's a three drop artifact equipment. Equipped creature gets plus two plus zero, oh, has menace, and is a pirate in addition to its other creature types. Whenever it becomes unattached from a permanent, destroy that permanent. I just it's like the thought of a creature picking up the hook and becoming a pirate. I am a pirate now. <laughs> it doesn't matter who you are. If you have a captain's hook, you're a pirate. We then have the Golden Guardian, which is an interesting creature. 
It is a artifact creature golem. It costs four for a four four with defender. You can pay two to have it fight another target creature you control. When Golden Guardian dies this turn, return it to the battlefield transformed under your control. You can tap it to add two mana of any one color to your mana pool because it transforms into the Gold Forge Garrison, which is a land. And then you can pay four and tap it to create a 4-4 four, four colorless Golem artifact creature token. So it's a Golem that it has to engage with a little civil mutiny with yourself, and when right. it dies, you can use it to make more of what it was. Well, here's the thing. I think the main reason to, to play this card is twofold. A, on the front side, we have a 4-4 Defender, which isn't bad, and you don't really care if he dies as much. The main reason to play this guy isn't necessarily that he creates 4-4s four at instant speed, which isn't bad, but that he taps for 2 mana of any one color to your mana pool, yeah. no matter your color restrictions. Yeah. The thing about the 2 cost fight spell, or fight effect, you would think that it necessarily has to be a creature bigger than him for him to die. Could just be death touch. It could just be a death touch creature or some other manner of creature that's like some for some reason like a four two or something where it doesn't need to be necessarily bigger than him and live. It really just depends on how willing you are, what you're willing to do to go uh, for a land that taps for two it mana. It could also be something as simple as you have the golden guardian, you have a one one. They attack with a 3-3 three, three Dino Token, you block with the Golden Guardian. Post-combat, you make it fight your 1-1, one, one, and then it flips. Right. All he says is he fights another target creature you can yeah. see, and then when he dies this turn. So he doesn't have to die as a result of Excuse that me. combat. <clears throat> so honestly, it's if it, if it were a 3-mana 4-4 four, four with Defender, I'd be a lot happier. But as it is, it's not terrible. It's not. We have... Ah, we do have a, a rare land. Only one this time, interestingly enough, because <coughs> we have lots of rare lands that don't start as lands. Yeah, you got you got to work there. The Arch of Araska. Ascend. It's a land with ascend. Tap to add a colorless mana to your mana pool. Pay five and tap. Draw a card. Activate this ability only if you have the city's blessing. It's kind of an expensive card draw. I mean, I guess if you really have nothing else going on, it's not <coughs> terrible, but... You know, cards like this, you have like, um, what was it, the Seagate card? You have Gaia Reach Sanitarium, although Gaia Reach Sanitarium is probably the best of these examples, but you have cards that you pay a decent amount of mana, and then it counting as a mana, that are slightly conditional in some way to draw a card, and it's usually not. It's a pl desperation play, I think. Right. If you're having, if you're at the point in the game where you have to pay five to draw a card, that's not a good sign. Yeah. Um, as far as other non-rare lands, I will say that the dual lands in this set have beautiful artwork. The artwork is fantastic, but it's they're strictly guild games. Yes, yeah, they're just kind of bad, but they look really good. Yeah. And that is our review of the rares, mythics, and a couple choice other cards in the set. Uh, I hope you enjoyed, and we will be seeing you out there at pre-release events and other <coughs> spell slinging activities. Arr! You thought you were a dinosaur. You're a dinosaur pirate now? Yeah, because he has the captain's hook. Mm. He's now a pirate. It's a pirate dinosaur. He's a pirate, human, merfolk, wizard, dinosaur. With vigilance, trample, haste. Can't forget the indestructible. Of course not. Flying. Flying. Double strike. <laughs> uh, phasing. Um, All seems pretty good. What was it? Echo. Yep. Banding. Can't yes. forget banding. Oh, Ban fading for sure. Bands with homerids. I mean dinosaurs. Yes. Bands um, with cephalopods. Yeah, cephalopod. No, trilobite. Trilobite. That's the answer. Trilobite. Uh, what else we got? Um, unblockable. Mm -hmm. Hexproof. Shroud. Uh, Death touch. I think was mentioned at one point. Uh, in fact. Um, haste. Haste. Menace. Menace. Trample. 
Uh, Defender. Defender, of Defender. course. How could we forget Defender? Um, really synergizes.